Welcome to the Merit Library at the Institute for Advanced Study, which is the epigraphic library and the home of the Squeeze Collection here. Uh, the Squeeze Collection covers mostly the Greek world uh, and with a focus in Athens and Attica, as well as some materials from the uh, Asia Minor and Northern Greece regions. And we're currently uh, operating the Crateros Project, which is our project to digitize that Squeeze Collection and make it openly available available uh, through a database online so that it can be used to democratize the study of epigraphy, uh, which has previously been restricted um, by virtue of the difficulty of accessing either squeezes, which are paper negatives of inscriptions, uh, or especially inscriptions themselves, which are largely held uh, in museums uh, and archaeological sites in Greece, Italy, uh, or whatever country from which the inscriptions come. Uh, so. Today we're going to give you a little bit of a look around our office here uh, and the Crateros project. We're going to show you what we do uh, to scan the squeezes and digitize them. And we're going to show you some squeezes. So I hope you come along with us for that. All right. Squeezes are made of filter paper, uh, and uh, the important aspects of filter paper are mostly its physical qualities. Uh, it's frequently used by chemists because it is acid-free, uh, and this is really important for objects that you're expecting to need to uh, hang on to for an extended period of time, uh, because the more acid you have in papers, the more likely they are to disintegrate and fall apart. Uh, so by having these acid-free, uh, they are preserved significantly better for a significantly longer period of time. Um, this particular squeeze has a little thing on it that says Epigraphical Museum, uh, which means that it came from the Epigraphical Museum in Athens. Most of the squeezes we have that came from the Epigraphical Museum in Athens were made in the 1930s uh, at the request of Benjamin Merritt. And so this squeeze is almost certainly from the 1930s uh, and is at this point going on 90 years old. But as you can see, it's in beautiful shape, uh, and that's really a result of the paper. The other important aspect of filter paper is that it has very high wet strength. You can get it wet and really pull on it uh, and it won't come apart at all. And that's important because the way that you make a squeeze is you take that wetted filter paper, you apply it to the front of an inscription that you want to capture, and then you take a stiff bristled brush and you pat that wet filter paper into all the crevices in the inscription. And then when it dries, you peel it off and you have that inscription um, captured as a negative on the filter paper. And this collection, one of the reasons that it's as important as it is, is because it would be essentially impossible to create a collection like this anymore. Um, it has become harder and harder to create squeezes because uh, although they are better than many other options uh, in terms of recording the face of an inscription, they're less damaging to the stone, for example, than a charcoal rubbing is, uh, they still can cause damage to the front of a stone. And so museums are reasonably hesitant uh, to allow people to do large numbers of squeezes. Um, and this is, this is fine, this makes sense. Uh, we're moving into an era where 3D photography will hopefully be able to replace that at some point, um, but that also takes a significant amount of time. Uh, and so a collection like this really allows you to essentially go through an enormous number of inscriptions in a relatively short period of time with a lot of physical ease. You can open up a box that has has 150 of these inscriptions in it and go through them in very quick order uh, and compare them. And so there are a variety of uh, different ways of using that ability. Um, one example would be the work of Stephen Tracy, uh, an emeritus professor from The Ohio State University, whose specialty is the handwriting of Masons. Uh, and to be able to detect and identify the handwriting of Masons, he essentially needs to be able to read an enormous number of inscriptions, one immediately after the other. Uh, and that's basically impossible to do with real inscriptions. Uh, and so he can only do this kind of work with squeeze collections like this one. Then once you've done that work, you can go and look at the inscription proper itself to try to uh, check a reading or some kind of letter that you're not sure about, whether it came across well on the squeeze. Um, but the genesis is made possible by collections like this one. The reasons for a squeeze, how you use a squeeze, the, the main importance is that it records the face of an inscription. And this is important because frequently we assimilate 
an inscription to the text of that inscription, right? Uh, but these are not, in fact, the same thing. Uh, the text of an inscription is usually a published interpretation of what can be read on that inscription by a professional epigrapher, whereas the face of an inscription is something that looks like this, right? Um, so the difference between the two is that this is going to show you letters that are partial, right? This is going to show you the shapes of the letters. Um, this is going to show you exactly what's on the stone. A text will show you things like restorations that have been made, right? Suggested completions of lines. Uh, frequently, it's going to show you letters as being complete letters that if you looked at the stone, you would be absolutely amazed because there's a single vertical line or something like that. And someone has decided that that's definitely a new. Um, so working directly with the surface of the stone is important. And that's what a squeeze is, is essentially a copy of that surface of the stone. And it's a copy of that surface of the stone at a particular moment in time. And this, again, is critical because stones deteriorate, right? Um, they deteriorate naturally once you've pulled them out of the ground and they're sitting out in the open air and people are coming by and looking at them and touching them and they're being moved from place to place, from apotheki to apotheki, right? They slowly deteriorate. And there's any number of, of times you'll read a book and you will see so-and-so saw in 1892 these letters. Those letters are no longer visible. Right? Um, so if you have a squeeze from that moment, then you'll have a pretty good idea of what was visible on the stone at that time and whether that person was just overstating what could be seen or whether, in fact, the surface of the stone has degraded. Uh, and in addition to simple natural degradation, uh, we have, for example, a fairly large collection uh, from Macedonia, from Greek Macedonia, uh, that were made by Charles Edson in the late 30s. Um, and what happened shortly after the late 30s was World War II. Right? And World War II was particularly brutal in northern Greece. Um, and quite a few of the stones that were made squeezes of in that process um, may well be entirely gone at this point. Um, and so these squeezes then preserve essentially the only uh, remaining evidence of those faces. Um, so the scanner that we use is a WideTech 25600 flatbed scanner. This is the same technology for digitization that Ohio State uses for their collection, which includes most of Steve Tracy's squeezes. Um, and you can actually see right here, this is what the scanner looks like. Um, we have two of these scanners uh, at the institute that we work with. They look mostly identical, except in one of them, I've taken these hinges off. Uh, and the reason for that is so that we can deal with squeezes that are this size, that are long like that. Uh, because when we have a squeeze that's larger than the squeeze bed, we run it through and take multiple pictures. So we take one picture, two picture, three picture, four picture. And then we put those pictures together with the photo merge function in Photoshop. But when we're using this scanner, we're using it with a 3D lighting function, which means that you get this 45 degree raking light on the squeeze. And this is, is great. It produces great results in terms of readability. But it means that a squeeze looks different. It produces a different photograph if it's going in right side up as opposed to upside down. So you can't take the squeeze and scan it in one direction and then turn it around and scan it in the other direction and plug the two together. They don't work. They won't look good together. Um, so we have to be able to run the whole thing through. As I said, we don't care about the color information, right? So we do it in grayscale. Uh, and the initial scanning creates 600 DPI TIFFs. These are enormous files, especially if you're photo merging them together, right? We have some photo merged files that are well over 10 gigabytes for a single image. Those are not the files that we're putting on the internet. The files that we're putting on the internet are, are noticeably smaller, but we are keeping those 600 DPI TIFFs as archival images. Um, we also scan every squeeze twice. Uh, so we scan the squeeze once, right side up, as it were, and then we rotate the squeeze 90 degrees to the right, and we scan it again. And there are two reasons for that. One is that this is raking light, and so it does a great job of picking up items that are perpendicular. So if you've got an iota and the light is hitting it like this, it shows up beautifully. If you've got an iota and the light is hitting it like this, it doesn't show up at all. So by turning it 90 degrees and having those two images, you're got a pretty good shot on one of them at picking up just about every line on the squeeze. So by looking at the two of them, you get a really good coverage. In terms of what we do um, after we've scanned them, so we've got these scans, um, we rotate all the images. Obviously, if it comes through right side up, we don't need to rotate it, right? Um, but for the one that we've got 90 degrees rotated, we rotate it right side up. The next thing is we unmirror it. 
right? Um, these are negatives, as I said, which means that they're the opposite of what you'd expect. You get pretty used to working with that um, when you're actually reading them, um, but if you're not that used to it, it can be a real bar to looking at them. And there's no difficulty in unmirroring them on the computer, right? We just flip the canvas uh, in Photoshop and it's fine. And then we slightly adjust the brightness and contrast. Um, so we turn the brightness down a little bit and the contrast up a little bit to help the readability. We do that uniformly. So we make the exact same brightness and contrast change on every single squeeze. This means that it's not always the perfect amount of adjustment but it's being scientifically done, right? So we're not reading our biases into the end image. We're just trying to produce a uniform set of results. We are also keeping these untouched copies of every single one of these squeezes so that if someone thinks, hey, the changes you've made have changed the image, they've changed the squeeze, um, we can give them an untouched copy and they can do whatever adjustments they feel are useful to them.